a warm welcome. I thought writers were supposed to be judgmental pricks. <laughs> Gosh, you know, I, midway through watching this version, and by the way, in 2D, it, it's a knockout. You know, you, I worried, and I thought, no, it's, it's, in fact, it's even stronger in certain ways because, you, you know, I mean, you're not so dazzled, you know, that, that, that you, can, you can get even closer in a way. I think it's actually cool to run it in, in, for this group in, in 2D. I hope you all didn't mind, but it, it kind of focuses you more to the narrative, you know, yeah. in a way. Well, I felt, you know, just because the imagery it's in itself is so spectacular. I, partway through watching it, I was thinking to myself, you know, this isn't movie making. It's like this guy's dreaming out loud, you know. And, and I thought, well, that's a good definition of storytelling, you know. And, I, it, and in terms of talking to story makers and, and writers, is there a working definition that you have of what a story is? Or do you have to find your way to it each time? What, how do you define story? Well, I, I think that, that storytelling is so innate to the process that I, I kind of don't think of it in, in those terms. Usually by the time I think that there might be something there enough to sort of sit down and, and tell it, I've already got all these kind of story fragments and some urge to go in a, in mm. a certain direction. Uh, so I'm almost kind of past the story by the time I start thinking right. about it in, in a way. Uh, and then it's, it's, it's structuring it out. I, for me, a story is always a journey of a character. You know, and the audience usually piggybacks on the, on that character, mm -hmm. whoever that that uh, that character is. Now, sometimes that breaks down when you have multiple characters and multiple storylines. You know, the first thing I ever wrote was the Terminator, and there we're following three different narrative lines, and they they converge at a certain moment in in time right. and space at the, at the end of the of the the, se uh, the first act, and then after that you pretty much you know follow follow Sarah mm -hmm. with a couple of cutaways to the Terminator. So that doesn't exactly always hold. But for me, it, uh, it, it's easiest to write stories that are the, the journey of a single character. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, you had spoken in dealing with the Titanic that uh, you were after a through-the-screen moment, you know, where the person is not outside, and you felt in Titanic that it was Rose basically having to rescue Jack. He's chained to the pipe, and she's, you know, the water's coming up, and no one will help her. And it, it occurs to me, off of what you just said, that that's the moment when all the threads, that's actually all the stories do converge actually at that moment. Is that, is that sort of the thing? Yeah, because earlier you're kind of bouncing around. You're following, following different narrative threads. You're following Jack separately, Rose separately, and bouncing around to different characters. And the film's kind of taking its time to come to a boil. Yeah. And I remember I, I just I, I kind of you know, had a moratorium on, on watching the film for a long time. I don't know, maybe like eight years or something like that. And I finally watched it with, with my younger kids recently. I hadn't seen it in ages. And I, th and I actually felt right around the time you're saying when Rose is looking for Jack is when the movie kicks into gear and it sort of got you by the throat at that point and then it's, it sort of got you through the end. So, you know, at that point you're two hours and ten minutes into the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a movie. It's not a TV show. You know? Yeah. Switch channels. Yeah. But it's interesting, you know, in terms of how, a, like, for instance, you ask David Mamet would say a story is – you know, a character has an intention, and when they've either fulfilled that intention or they can't do it, boom, that's when your story ends. And I was mulling that a little bit in preparation for our talk and realized, well, there's a moment when Sigourney Weaver, midway through the movie, the Dr. Grace, says, oh, I would die to get a sample. <laughs> right? And I thought, well, there's your character intention. And as luck would have it, she does. Yeah, yeah. She, she actually fulfills that intention. And she gets the sample. So, and she is the sample. I, yeah, she is the sample. Yeah, that's actually very clever. She, she is the sample. She's, she, we don't know exactly what happens to Grace at that point, but, uh, and I'm not saying. Well, yeah. That, that, now, I wonder, you know, you've created just a may, I was going to come to this later, but you've got, you leave us at such a rich point of departure. I mean, you've rhymed. You know, the movie opens with an eye opening. Now it's like in a new state of being. Will, is there a, do you think the narrative might continue? Oh well, I think that was that was definitely our intention. In fact, that's how I pitched it, you know, rather shamelessly to the studio. I said, "Look, it's going to cost us a fortune to create all these CG assets and characters and everything, but we can use them in other movies because they'll be free then, you know." <laughs> and that, you know, I mean, I had I had to create a business model. This wasn't this wasn't just a wasn't just a story pitch. It was a business your pitch. own unobtainium. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, so it was always the, in the intention. Uh, you know, I mean, I hate the term franchise, but I think the idea of a persistent world that once people have invested in it and they, and they like characters and they, and they like the, the, general, the general environment of a story, that you can have continuity over time, yeah. I think there's something really cool about that. I mean, uh, you know, I've, I've always loved... 
I've always loved what the, what uh, you know what happened in the Star Trek universe. Sure. And, uh, although I haven't always loved the the uh, the Lucas universe, I love. Uh, but I, but I've always I've always loved things within the within the movies and loved the sense of continuity. Well, to touch upon the Lucas universe for a moment, you said something interesting about that years ago. It was you were not knocking Lucas at all, but you were saying that the science fiction that you were fed upon growing up, you know, thinking I don't know Isaac Asimov or whoever, it's just it's. Science fiction is about ideas. You felt, and that that Lucas had lost that thread. That was no. I mean, well, he he made it. He made it. Uh, uh, you know, kind of the the hero cycle. He made it. He made it a mythic archetype, and there was a uh, there was a joyfulness and a celebration of that of the of the energy and the dynamics of of that. But it, it, for me, and, and that's great. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, what happened was when Star Wars came out, all of Hollywood just went that way and forgot that science fiction. Historically, through the fifties and sixties, and and uh, and and seventies up till Star Wars, Star Wars had been a dystopian uh, kind of genre where it was about the problems of technology and the and the you know the the thing the, the way the the unsettling feeling that we get as our world changes through technology going into the into the future, and we we lost all that. We it, it just seemed like all of a sudden you couldn't tell that story anymore. So, you know, Avatar was, I suppose, you could say, is, is an attempt to kind of have your cake and eat it, too. Mm-hmm. Hey, do, do the, 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 the you know, mythic, heroic kind of story with a sense of, of destiny and big epic battles and all that, but have the dystopian cautionary component to that, yeah. you know, and, and have one be the spoonful of sugar to the, to the other. In terms of this balance, it's interesting because... I recently been doing an essay about your work, and especially with this, and, and had to take note, you know, there was a flying Dutchman on the Internet who basically compared Pocahontas line by line to the outline of this. And, uh, you know, it's a good laugh, but at the same I time... I debated you know, having the, you know, the Colors of the Wind song, actually, <laughs> in <laughs> Avatar, but... But, you know, it's... almost a, did. We put one at the end. But I thought, you know... Here you are, you know, you, you, you take a primal story. It's a little like, you know, the, the way opera composers have a success of, like, taking a story that is well-known so that you can try all kinds of new music out to, to, to advance the theme. And it seemed to me that if you had taken a story that was less familiar, maybe people might have gotten lost in the, in the wilderness that you create. And because you have a primal story that we actually feel, that's the one familiar ground. And I'm, yeah, well, I think that, about that, that. Part, of, part of myth is, is familiarity. You know, mm. myth has to feel like it has roots in prior art going back through traditions of storytelling going back quite far. And, you know, my, my approach to this film was I thought, oh, my God, I've got this, I've got this horrendous, huge kind of startup torque of exposition. They're going to go to another planet. The guy's a paraplegic. He's got a backstory. What's happening on the planet? They're mining on obtanium. Uh, obtanium is a mm. room temperature superconductor. floats in the magnetic field. And, and uh, they've got this avatar program. And... And uh, he's going to go into a link, and he's going to go into this other body through a psionic link, and people are going to ask, you know, well, if you die in that world, do you die? You know, and and you know, I st- when I started to write the script, I was probably sixty pages in before he got into the jungle. Right. And I said, all right, well, this shit ain't working. <laughs> so I need to I need to drop back, make the movie much more visual, much less dialogue. Pages of dialogue flew across the room, and and. I completely retold the story uh, in, a, in a much more familiar archetypal way. Now, still embedded within that. I mean, pe- people that, that uh, I mean, it's always amusing to me when they say, well, it, it's just Dances with Wolves. Yeah, because Dances with Wolves took place on another planet where people projected their consciousness into <laughs> other bodies that were 10 foot tall and blue. It's like, no, we I intentionally wanted to use familiar, familiar touchstones of yeah. storytelling that were historical and and reflect them through through a lens from the from the future, so that I could take some of these more difficult concepts, seed them in there, and people would pick them up along the way because that's all they had to trip over yeah. were those ideas and not the and not the big not, you know kind of not the big gestural stuff. Right. Another exciting aspect, and it it goes back to you know that the Sigourney, that the, the Doctor Grace has actually a quite a complex destiny based on that simple intention. I mean, her intention is to merge with this planet in some way. She succeeds. But it's true of every character is basically fulfilling something. I mean, even, you know, the colonel, you know, even though he's, he's, he's a, a full-on bully, you know, he's got that great scar on top of his head. So he's, he's Ahab. Ahab. Yeah. He's an Ahab character, absolutely. He's, he's been scarred by that, 
place uh, psychologically and emotionally. And and while he justifies everything to himself as I've got a mission to do, I've got to protect these people, I've got to protect these guys, that's my job, whatever it takes. You know, in fact, you know, it it's become obsessive for yeah. him. And and I think I think that's very clear. It's very simple. Again, I mean, we all know the 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 Ahab archetype. Right. And you know, Grace was actually fun because here's someone who's so wants to understand is so in love with this place and with this world especially this this sort of plant consciousness that she's sort of dimly aware of you know she's getting this glimmering sense of what this thing could really be and she gets to merge with it she gets to merge with the mind of a plant as a botanist you know that's a pretty cool idea right it's in a way the the flip sides of the same coin because her her she has what might be called a positive death wish, and he has a negative because he says, "As long as I'm bre- not while I'm breathing," is basically well, okay. Yeah, that can be arranged. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Takes a while, but it's arranged. And but it's yeah, inter- well, as, as Stephen Lang would say, "You think two arrows to the heart are going to take me out? <laughs> <laughs> it ain't over till my DNA is expunged from the universe." <laughs> well, the he's a pretty funny guy if you ever get a chance the, to meet him. He, he gives a great performance there too, because he gives layers to the to the character. Yeah, the trick with 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 slang, I think uh, we call him slang, Stephen Lang. The, s- the trick with with slang's uh, character, which he picked up on right away, and he's a very very nuanced actor, very chameleonic, almost unrecognizable from role to role, and very accomplished stage actor, and, mm-hmm. and well recognized in New York, so on. Uh, but he understood the power of of creating iconic character. You know, not trying to to push against what the character was, or uh, but to push toward what the character was, mm-hmm. so that in a sense, what you see is what you get. And when he's sitting, kind of the the the, the shot that, all, that I think always sort of defines his character is when he's sitting on the workout bench under the light, and his body is all covered by scars, and he has this kind of wry look on his face, kind of looking at the new guy coming in. It's like it's an image; it's character as image. He never changes. He's a freaking rock. He, there is no character arc. For him, he's the same guy as he's dying that he was in, in, in the, at the get go. Right. You know, I think that's okay. You know, I actually had this problem with uh, Leonardo on, on Titanic. I said, You don't change, she changes. You go through a lot of stuff and you impart knowledge to her, and there's a transfer of energy from you to her. She's the character that changes, you're the pivot. Mm-hmm. And he hated that. Mm-hmm. I don't get an arc. It's like, <laughs> No, you don't get an arc. <laughs> Well, you know, in terms of a few, it's, you're doing several things here that feel new. One of them strikes me as a fusion because uh, that is to say the word avatar, you know, could mean a divine being in a human body. But more, more commonly now it's in game speak, you know, an avatar is your representative on a game board. And it seems to me that because games have, becoming, have been becoming more narrational, it strikes me that you're fusing that by, in a sense, creating a scenario where you can elect where you want to have your sympathies, so to speak, in here, and the audience may be gaming the movie while they're watching. And I wonder if I you think could... you do that for a while throughout mm-hmm. the film, and certainly it was our intention in the game, you know, in the Ubisoft game, that you can pick one side or the other. You can you can play for the blue team or the green team, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, uh, I, I think in the movie, my intention at least was that there's a certain point in time where you pick your side. Right. And of course, because the movie is this movie, at least specifically, is a journey through the eyes of a character, yeah. Jake. When he picks a side, you've picked that side. Right. The question is, can you take an audience of human beings and get them to to vote against themselves by the end of the movie? You know, and the answer is yes, you can, because everybody cheers, you know, for <laughs> right. the for the blue guys. But the reason is because subconsciously people know the truth of how this movie works, which is that the Navi are human as well. Mm-hmm. The Navi are the best po- they represent the the better aspects of ourselves that we wish we were or hope we're evolving toward and the humans in the film represent the more venal corrupt aggressive uh, uh you know uh, entitled versions of ourselves that we hope that we're evolving away from so you know it's really it's all about it's all about human ideas and and human emotions just you know we're reflecting it back again through that that mirror of science fiction it's interesting, too, because uh, apparently there's a report on CNN about an interesting problem psychiatrists have been having. There's some people that are so ecstatic in their wanting to be Pandorans that they, they really don't want to come back out. And it's, they've had to be kind of talked down, which is not your 
Is that that's not your problem? Um, it seems to be a rave review. Uh, I mean, in a sense, you it's know, the ultimate rave review. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's a little sad. I also think it's it's kind of there's a certain degree of fan hyperbole in that. Yeah. But to the extent that that's true. I would say this movie was meant to reacquaint us with the miracle of the natural world here on our own planet. We don't know of a planet, Pandora. We don't know of any other planet that even has life at this point. So if you really feel that way, take a walk in the woods on a misty morning or, or, you know, go fishing, you know, or or, or go snorkel around, you know, on, on a coral reef in Hawaii or something, you know, I mean... That's that's really what what it's about. I mean, we live in a society that's progressively moving toward a state of nature deficit disorder, and people just need to reconnect. That's all. Right. I want to open it up up, up the floor to questions. Uh, just so you know, I'll I'll probably repeat your question if it's soft, uh, not to sound like the Monty Python translator, but you, that way everybody can hear it. So, your question, sir. Good question. Questions about consistent world, that is to say, aspects of Terminator, mechanized devices and so on that are in Terminator also continue here. Well, I think your your question specifically is about the dual rotor system. Yeah, I mean, of course, because I'm a, a complete engineering geek, we actually built a prototype of that of that uh, dual rotor system and flew it around the parking lot just to make sure it would really work. Uh, although I had done that years before I started on Avatar just because I thought it was a cool design. And technically the ones in, in uh, Terminator are a turbofan uh, system and these are a, a twin prop rotor, counter-rotating prop rotor system. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and your second What's your question? other question? Because <laughs> I don't want to spiral down that, that, that geek rat hole now. Moving the imagery of evil from one movie to support the ev- image of evil in another. Yeah, I think that's interesting. You're 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 uh, uh, you're drawing a, a stylistic through line between the the flying what we called the hunter killers, the aerial hunter killers in the Terminator, uh, my two Terminator films, uh, and the, uh, the 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 style of the helicopter or, or rotorcraft in in Avatar. Yeah, I think there's the, there's a sense of a of that sense of dread that you get in the face of a highly mechanized army coming toward you, one that has all these weapons and aerial assets and so on. So, yeah, there probably was a subconscious connection there. And obviously there's an endoskeletal suit in this one that's similar to the, uh, uh, you know, quite different in its specifics, but similar thematically to the endos- or, uh, exoskeletal suit that, um, that uh, Sigourney Weaver used. Um, although I, I actually like the inversion, the fact that here, you know, the shiny, the shiny black creature that's fighting the, the exoskeletal suit is actually the good guy yeah. uh, in, in this movie. And fun with those kinds, of, those kinds of, uh, of inversions and the fact that, you know, Sigourney's playing a character in this film who is referred to as the alien by the, by the Navi. Mm-hmm. That's, in this, uh, to follow a theme here, you know, the, the gentleman's question also deals with the fact that you do think as an engineer and without disappearing down that hole, nevertheless, you, as a storyteller, it seems that observation of what's possible in engineering does feed your imagination. I wonder if you could talk about how that works together, how you integrate those two passions. I think as a writer, you have to make certain decisions about what your reality parameters are in any, in any film. For example, I was working on a, on a film, uh, a script about a, a human uh, expedition to Mars, relatively near future, very, very reality based, all based in real technologies that that exist today or will exist in the next next few years. And I did a tremendous amount of research with the NASA community and so on. And every single term and detail had to be right. And the engineering I felt had to work in the in the designs for the film. We did a lot of design work that that I did in parallel with the writing process, so I'd know how a door opened. I'd know how they set up the habitat and so on. With Avatar, I knew that it was basically not even hard science fiction in the classic sense. It was actually kind of um, you know, an allegorical fantasy in the guise of a hard science fiction film. Uh, and so because I knew that I was doing a fantasy, uh, uh, you know, I knew that I could have floating mountains, and I could find some bullshit justification for it by calling up an astrophysicist friend of mine and saying, hey, how can I have floating mountains? But you know, it wasn't the, 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 I wasn't letting the narrative flow out of the environment and the environment be determined by the engineering like I was on that, that other project. So here I'm working backwards from 
from uh, you know big thematic uh, gestures that I want to make anyway, and then just sort of back justifying it so it has a little bit of a patina of reality. Well, and yeah, you and you do confirm it kind of like with the, the Michelle Rodriguez character saying, "Oh, we're in the zone," and you, she refers to some you know like you, you've moved into the cusp of gravity. Yeah, zones yeah. Well, this big intense magnetic field, and they actually, uh, there actually was an explanation for why the, how the mountains float in a scene that was taken out where where Jake's wheeling his wheelchair between where the ship has landed and getting into the remote laboratory. And he says, yeah, why do they float? Well, Grace explained it to me, something about superconduction and, and uh, the mountains made out of unobtainium, and uh, I don't understand it. And at least right. somebody does. And, you know, it was kind of one of those, like, sort of explain it, but don't. And uh, when that scene got cut out, it, it left, and I thought, you know what? I don't miss it at all. It's like the mountains freaking float. Well, you know? yeah. <laughs> also... You know, in a way, you're in your unconscious mind because you've got the you've got that enormous gas giant of a planet, not a sun, that's actually close by. So you you're you're looking right from the moment the movie begins at several gravitational fields. So it, in a weird way, the audience will grow the the they'll grow your explanations for He's you. He's good. <laughs> anyway, I'm not to not to delay. Yeah, the trick, by the way, what you just said is growing an explanation in your own mind is is fine. That's fine. It, it makes the audience's imagination should be participatory in the movie. It it shouldn't be unit. It shouldn't be a unidirectional process. Here, I'm handing out all the good ideas. <laughs> you know, it's great if you can trigger people to invest in the movie enough to have to to bring bring something to the game. Yeah. Now, the questions that are close up, I'll get to next. Is one way in the back first? Yes, yours, man. Did everybody hear that question? Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, we you know we we have a we have a really variegated population because we've migrated over time all over our planet and and uh, and populations that that were isolated for periods of time are now mixing together. You look at indigenous po- I'll answer the second part first. You look at indigenous populations; they tend to be much more similar to each other. Uh, they tend to not have as much color variegation, or or you know you don't have a, a mixture of mesomorphs and ectomorphs and, and uh, you know, whatever the other one. Um, uh, you know, all in, in the same endomorphs. Mm-hmm. Thank you. See? Um, uh, so anyway, that was the theory. If you look at, if you, look at uh, uh, you know, we, we, we studied a lot of, of photos of, of uh, you know, various indigenous peoples, whether it was in the Amazon basin or, or in Africa, Indonesia, Ab- you know, uh, Aborigines in, uh, in Australia or, or whatever. And they all tend to, to be uh, m- much more similar. Uh, so that was, just, that was just the guideline for that. And they tend to want to variegate from each other probably because of that, that physical similarity through wild body painting and all kinds of ornamentation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the themes that we saw throughout all these cultures, especially the, the, or, or primarily the ones that lived in warm climates, was that they had no conscious uh, uh, sense of, of modesty the way we would uh, but they would have; they would be very elaborate in their individual uh, uh, ornamentation, um, and so we had to try to thread the thread, you know, through those ideas. And the biggest problem from a design standpoint was was dressing the the women in such a way that they didn't look like they were wearing bikinis like Raquel Welch in One Million Years B.C. Mm-hmm. You know, I said nothing that looks like a bikini top. So we had things that draped and fell and so on. You know, I mean, obviously we had to cover the the breasts for, or to some extent, for the PG thirteen rating. You know, but trying to make it at least feel like it was a, a true indigenous culture because they, you know, for the most part, they don't care. They just they you know, they they'll have some elaborate headdress and some elaborate neck thing and then just be naked. You know, and I would have loved to have done it that way, but nobody would have bought it. They would have thought it was purient, purient or sexual or, or whatever. And it's it's not in their cultures, but you know, that's the limitation of creating media for. Uh, for a specific culture, and interestingly, you know, Avatar is playing in 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 all uh, cultures around the world that are at least developed enough to have a movie theater and, and fifteen bucks. You know, <laughs> <laughs> to the first part and of the, the first part. Refresh my memory no, on the first part. No scales, no fur. No. Oh, uh, on the on the creature yeah. design. Yeah, you know, uh, no since feathers. it's a group of writers, let me start the design process at the writing stage because I think you know films that are strongly. Uh, a visual, whether they're in the science fiction or the fantasy realm, like like Avatar, tend to be criticized as well. That's not real writing, you know. But in fact, every th- every every uh, image is a moment of the narrative, and those images have to be imagined at some point, and that starts in the writing process. So every one of these creatures was proposed on paper up to a certain level. 
Uh, for example, the dire horse was described as a, a 17-foot-tall armored six-legged horse. Um, okay, so that, that sets a challenge to the design group uh, to, do some, to, to, to do something. Now, there's no detail in that whatsoever. We don't know what color it is. Actually, I think I said they were purple. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the details took a year. From, from that verbal description to the end, uh, end result in all its detail. The banshee was just described as a, as a, uh, a large flying creature. Uh, and when we got into the design process, you know, everybody started drawing banshees, my, my creature design artists, and they either looked like a pterodactyl or they looked like a dragon or, uh, you know, they looked like something, something in some way specifically familiar. And I said, we need to, we need to figure out what our metaphor is for the for the for the banshee, and ultimately I I applied that principle to everything. I said, "What's our metaphor? What are we trying to say this is?" And then how do we push away from it into alien territory, but not so alien that it's lost its its uh, immediate resonance for the audience? And so for the for the banshee, we came up with four wings instead of instead of two, and that the aft wing would sort of function as a tail sometimes, and sometimes as a wing, and that it has a very uh, uh, fish-like mouth structure that's actually based on a barracuda. And the, the metaphor that I that I propose to them is, this isn't a dragon, it's an eagle, it's a bird of prey. It's incredibly beautiful. Uh, it's very sleek and very very fast and not ungainly. And uh, so that was you know, but but we did it by way of you know a kind of bat like membranous wing and so things like that. So you propose a challenge in the writing process, and then that that uh, that word picture gets interpreted by the artist, and then there's an iterative process of taking some of the best ideas that the artists come up with and and combining them. And you know, we just we had endless discussions about you know, are they furred? Are they feathered? Are they scaled? You know, and I didn't want to do anything that was that familiar, so we came up with this kind of blend of this of this kind of smooth, almost amphibian-like skin with these um, these highly flexible scales. Uh, uh, broad scales that formed a kind of very thin chitinous armor, kind of like almost a snake belly or the or the the, the body of the tail of a shrimp, for example. These were metaphors that that are uh, little bits of of the um, uh, textural vocabulary that we used in the design process. And the colors came from uh, poison dart frogs, Amazon uh, frogs, and um, and coral reef fish. The color patterns and textures. You have a question down? Yes, you had a question there. What was well, your decision process making the Navi based on an African tribe? Uh, what we tried to do was not locate it at any specific uh, 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 cultural basis. So we took aspects of uh, uh, Native American, uh, South American in indigenous cultures like the uh, like the Yanomami and the Guarani and, and people like that, Indonesian cultures, African cultures, so on. We looked at the types of tribal painting and or ornamentation and hairstyles and so on that were used really all over the world. The thing is, the second you show a bow, uh, a bow and arrow in this country, everybody just goes Native American. Okay, I, I got this. But in fact, the bow the bow is almost ubiquitous. Through uh, you know through uh, uh, you know what we would call primitive technically primitive cultures, although really the bow is a very sophisticated thing. Uh, in fact, the only culture I found that didn't use a projectile weapon was the the Maori culture in um, in uh, New Zealand because uh, they like to just get up to you and kill you by hand. They don't <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I think that's a choice. You know, they probably knew about the ah bow. That's 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 cowardly. That's that's true. We did, and that wasn't by design. It just sort of worked out that way. Uh, you know, it, we we found Zoe first. She was amazing. She she absolutely completely inhabited the character right from the from the get go. And then as as you know, I, I, but you fact, also got Wes Studi in there too. You, Wes Studi, who's who's yeah. uh, who's Native American, you know. And, and honestly, at one point, I said to my casting director, "We got to get some white actors in here. Are people going to think we're doing this on purpose?" And and but ultimately, as as a as a director, I got to go with the the person that I think shows me the thing I need to see in terms of their performance. And it just kind of worked out that way. Questions from your questions are in check shirt. Sure. Well, I mean, look, everybody's writing process is different. Some people are very disciplined. They get up at, you know, 6 a.m., they work for X hours, and then they go to the bar or whatever. You know, I mean, I, I historically have always written at night. 
just because it's quiet time, nobody bothers you, um, and I need a lot of isolation. I need to stay in the, the kind of force field of the ideas for days on end to, in whatever way I can do that. I have to kind of I kind of isolate, and as a, as a dad with five kids, that's not easy. So I'll do, there's a preliminary period of the writing where I'll be doing notes and maybe do, just structuring stuff out in a kind of a, a treatment form or a no, more novelistic form. When I actually start scene work and, and just actually writing scenes, that's when I've sort of got to break away and, uh, and just really focus for some extended period of time, a couple weeks at a time. So in the case of Avatar, I went up to my, to my ranch and just told everybody to stay the hell away. And and just and wrote the problem with Avatar was it, it was it was funny I had written this thing in in ninety five that was a, a treatment or you know what we laughingly refer to as a scriptment which by the way just for the record scriptment was meant to be a joke term there was a treatment that mutated out of control into toward trying to be a script you know and it, it somehow got adopted. You know, but anyway, so it was this. It was this sort of hundred-page single, uh, single-spaced novelistic style document with very little dialogue in it. Basically, you know, with a you know, there would be a line that said, and then a big argument happens. You know, and now when I blew that up to script form, and I started just very linearly, sort of progressing through it and turning it into script form, and I alluded to it earlier, the sort of expository issue that I had with getting the whole story right. framed at the beginning. I wound up about halfway through the treatment at somewhere around 140 pages. I thought, well, you know, now I've got a decision to make. I can throw everything out or I can progress through to the end, let the ideas continue to just flow, see what I've got, and then shrink the whole thing, take out the unthread the things that need to be taken out of it. So I elected to tr- charge through to the end, and I'm glad I did because certain things I wrote I would not have written if I had gone back and restructured it first. Uh, so then I wound up with a 220-page script, which I did not show to anyone or they would have had a cow. And then I just <laughs> flipped around the next day and started started a rewrite and started started chopping it down. And when I turned it in, I think it was 150 pages or something like that. But it turns out that in the actual process of making the film, that 150 pages translated to about three hours and 20 minutes or something like that. So um, it didn't scale out well uh, between page count and, and, and minute count. So the, th- the, the final draft of the script was the last six months of the editing process. And you know, were I to do it again, if we do another Avatar film, I'm, I'm absolutely refusing to launch the project with anything over 110 pages because now I know that of, the, of this film and what it requires and the fabric of the world, that's about the ratio. Uh, that it's going to be closer to you know a minute a minute and a half a page than a minute a page, but now I know that at least you know I mean th- I always say you're never qualified to make a movie until you've just finished it. <laughs> Question way up back there, sir. You, you in the black jacket? Yes. It's shot. Yeah. We shot it, and we finished the visual effects. It looked absolutely gorgeous, and I chopped it out at the last, not at the last second, but probably uh, three or four months before we delivered the picture. And the reason was I felt like the movie started twice. And it's interesting. I wound up going back to my initial instinct. In, in my, my first draft that I turned into the studio, there was no earth opening. It started in space. And there was this concern that, uh, you know, I get a lot of studio notes and stuff. And I actually do, I actually do read them. I, you know, I, I, give them their, I give them their day in court, then reject them. No, I give, you know, I, I, I really do. I, I, like to, I like to get feedback as long as I'm not bound to follow them. You know, I'll, I'll you know, and, and I say that to them. I say, hey, man, give me 50 pages of notes. I don't care. It's good, it's good to have the feedback. As long as I don't have to do them, I'm happy to read them. And, you know, something, and they know by now that I actually do kind of read them and think about them, and sometimes I act on them, and, you know, frankly, usually I don't. But, but they think of that as, as progress and, and some, some sense of, of, of interaction with the production, which gives everyone comfort. So in, in this particular case, there was a concern that, that Jake wasn't a rich enough character. We didn't understand his journey and all those things. And, you know, I suppose instinctively when I had done the the, the first draft where there was no earth opening I just know that if you, if you find the right actor you're going to see it in his eyes and it's what he doesn't say and what he doesn't do that actually define him as much as what he ultimately does and I knew that with Jake you know the guy doesn't do a lot in the, in the, in the first act other than just real knee jerk survival stuff and he doesn't really do a whole lot during the second act other than go with a will toward trying to become one of these people he doesn't take definitive action 
in, in, in a sense that changes the history or changes the destiny of his, of his environment uh, until the third act. So I knew I had to have a guy that could hold the center for that. You know, anyway, I'm digressing slightly, but you know, a lot of that is the, is the power of what Sam brings to the movie. So anyway, in response to those notes and just a sort of an un- unease myself about, about the character, I wrote that Earth opening series of, of quick scenes. And when we shot it and cut it and, and finished it, it came out to about four and a half minutes, and it worked really well. Standalone, it worked really well. You're really there. You get him. You get his whole thing that he does not. He does not tolerate a bully. That there's something innate in his character that feels like he has to. He has to stand up for the oppressed or someone that can't can't defend themselves. And I think a lot of people actually get into the military because of that sense of duty, to pr- uh, that protective urge. And and I know a lot of Marines, and that's how they think. It's like we're going to go do the do the fighting, so so you guys don't. And uh, you know, so it, it seemed it seemed to make sense both with his. It, it told a bit of his background and gave you a glimpse into him and all that. It all worked beautifully. It's just that when we looked at the overall uh, story arc as it as it sat on the screen as a as a cut film, it felt like the movie started twice, and so we just chopped it off. But we kept little flashback. We kept in the form of a few flashback images some of the things that that had been uh, uh, in, in in actual full scenes in that uh, opening sequence of scenes, like the crematorium or the seeing the dead brother and so on. Wove them in as flashbacks. Did it in like a morning. Came in that day, said, "Look, I want to chop off the beginning." Said to the editor, "I actually had two editors working with me. This is one I didn't want to do myself, even though I was one of the editors on the film." I said, "I want you guys to do this. I want you to propose something to me. Just chop off the, the whole opening, take these shots, put them in in flashback form, figure out a structure." And one guy cracked part of it, the other guy cracked the other part of it. We stuck it together. By the end of the day, we had the opening of the movie as it as it sits up there right now. It's very interesting because with. Uh in terms of him not having a definitive arc or taking action until the third act, nevertheless, Dr. Grace becomes a very powerful sort of... She creates an arc because she doubts him from the instant he gets there so that when he... His first action, really, in a way, is to pull the leads off himself and go jumping out into the garden. So that, and, and, of course, the person that kind of blesses him for doing that is Grace in a weird way, even though she's still against him. And so then it's the the following thing is him out in the jungle and her thinking he'll never make it. And of course he does make it. So right. I, you, I think you, you I, there's a difference kind of between hurdles. taking action in a moment right. and making a decision to take action that changes changes the direction of events. Yes. And he's pretty reactive early in the film. Yeah. He wakes up, he can feel his feet. He, he doesn't think about what he's going to do next. Right. He just jumps up and goes for a run. He's a very impulsive character. He's a very curious character. Um, he's a very willful character, and and I, I I consciously didn't want to draw him as a deep thinker, right. you know, as a guy who was uh, you know who was overthinking the whole process. I wanted him to be a guy who would leap first and ask questions later. And a lot of Marines are are, are like that. It's by by nature. But he's a guy who does something she can never do, because as a scientist, her her analytical reserve and her objective detachment prevents her from really ever becoming. Navi, even though she speaks the language fluently, right. understands their culture, understands their religion, understands their history, and has 50 advantages that he never has, she can never do what he does innately just by leading with his heart. Yeah. He just jumps in heart first, and not just the, the, the Neytiri part of that, but just the overall just right. joy of being, uh, being one of them or wanting to become one of them. Well, it's what Natiri reacts to in him, you know. So it's, it, but there's like these, this lovely series of confirmations, so that in a way, we're being told who he is. He's defining who, who he is for us, and because of that, we're rooting for him to make the decision that he does in Act Three. And it seems to be the that's, that's great. The, Where were you when I was writing this? It would have made it so much easier. <laughs> yeah, right. It's easy after the fact. Yeah, yeah right. You know. Uh, Okay, boy, wonderful. Your question, red, red hair. You, you, no, uh, yeah, well, yours and then yours. Okay, two redheads. Two redheads. What are the odds? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, all that just kind of, uh, kind of, you know, I, I wrote this treatment back in 95, and I don't honestly remember what the specific sort of precursor ideas to that were, other than I used to 
to draw and paint a lot of kind of bioluminescent forests and things like that. And I always knew the forest. You know, you say, you know, the ship is a character in Titanic and the forest will be a character in Pandora. And these are kind of, what does that mean? It doesn't really mean anything. But actually, I started to think of the forest as a, as a presence. And then it, it wasn't a big cognitive leap to the idea that the forest actually was a sentient presence. And, you know, the, you know, the secular hard science fiction interpretation is that it is a real entity that is explained as this kind of big uh, global neural net. And because of the scale of that neural net, it actually has sentience and can act, can take in information and act. And then the sort of the non-secular interpretation is that, you know, it, Mother Nature really is alive on, on Pandora and she's going to kick your ass if you, if you mess with the balance of things. And I think it sort of works, it sort of works both ways. But... The guy, the guy the theory. theory. Yeah, yeah. Well, people Gaia. have people. Uh, you know, before the kind of monotheistic religions, there's there. You know, back into the to, to the mists of prehistory, there have been many, many uh, traditions and and uh, and uh, religions and belief systems structured around the idea of nature worship. And of course, trees are the most obvious physical symbols of of nature. And you know, from the from the Druids to a lot of the the pagan cultures in in uh, in Europe at about the same time as the Druids. And you know, thing is, I found out this all out later. You know, after I'd had Avatar written, you know, I started to you know read books and download stuff about about the worship of trees and the ideas of uh, of of nature worship and and goddess based religions and the cycle of death and rebirth that are celebrated in in the so called pagan mystery religions and so on, and how those fed into a lot of the early uh, kind of ceremonies of Christianity set, set around, uh, uh, you know, Christmas being the winter east equinox and, and Easter being the, 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 the winter solstice, spring equinox, yeah, right. And, and uh, you know, all that stuff. So there's this enormous, enormous rich tradition that goes way back into the, to the, to the uh, archetypes of, of human thought on this. And so, you know, th- there are times, I think, as a filmmaker when you just like how it looks, you know, and yet you know uh, that it's that it's highly freighted with meaning in in different areas, and so you have to, you know. So I'm I'm attracted to to images and ideas that work at a kind of an unspoken level or or almost a, a an unconscious or subconscious level. This is something. This, by the way, is a theory that sort of emerged for me more as I was cutting the picture, because I I realize now looking at the movie that I was being drawn to kind of. Um, Images and and visual ideas that had power, but didn't know, but couldn't always articulate exactly why they had had power. And at that point, when I have that feeling, now I realize I'm starting to tap into something mm-hmm. that is is getting to a more universal level of experience. And um, and so I, I've tried in the in the way that the surrealist artists uh, consciously tried not to to uh, mediate their dream images, but just paint them. They had an image in a dream. They would just paint it. They wouldn't try to figure it out. They would just paint it. You know, I, I've been trying to do the same thing with this movie to create a connection to a kind of uh, what I call a lucid dream state. And you know, and a, a good example would be you know, many of us, if not most of us, have dreams of flying when we're kids, and yet when we're adults, that tends to fade away. I know it's faded away in my life. I still have the occasional one and cherish it, but it, I used to have them every night. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know where that comes from, but it, maybe it's just a sense of, of, of the uh, when you're a kid, you don't know what the boundaries of the possible are. And when you're an adult, you know what they are because kids live in a kind of world that's half reality and half fantasy all the time because they haven't they haven't created a sense of what those boundaries are. What I tried to do with Avatar was reverse that process, start taking those boundaries away where you can have floating mountains and you can go and fly and feel the joy of flight and all those things, which puts you back into that childlike half half uh, half awake half asleep kind of kind of feeling and not try to overly analyze or mediate it which is why i've tried to keep the talking to a minimum uh in the movie you know and and there and thereby you know uh, you know reaped a lot of scorn from reviewers that like 20 page dialogue scenes you know <laughs> and but you know quentin does that you know god bless him you know he does that i i can't do it like he does you know funnily enough the abyss i thought that you stopped about you know, five minutes short of the Gaia myth because that seemed to be where you were headed, and it almost felt like this was an organic replication. You were you were acting that that 
that Pandora was the next step beyond the abyss. Did you feel a connection between the two films? Yeah, I think you know that that I think you were talking about this sort of co connection of visual thematic ideas through the movies, and and they're they're dev I mean the use of color in the abyss I think is, is particularly striking, and and again probably unconscious, you know, doing a a purple glowing tree and associating that particular color with a sense of of uh, of mysticism or a connection to a to a higher power or a greater force. I used the same color scheme in the abyss and totally forgot that I had done that. Huh. Your question, sir. It's probably related, but I can't remember. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you're the first... Yeah. By the way, I've been blabbing on for two months about this frickin' movie, and you're the first one that's ever used, used deus ex machina. And that was something that was actually consciously in my mind. It's like, all right, if I'm, if I'm going to have, you know, if, in, in, obviously in, in, you know, in, in, uh, in Greek tragedy, you know, the god and the machine, the, 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 the god appears levered down onto the stage. At the, and, and it's like in, in, in uh, your very first, you know, story writing or lit class, they tell you, don't ever do that. that that's bad. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. You know, so I thought, well, you know, what about if I want that to happen and I want to have that major, you know, nature shows up and spanks the, spanks the bad guys, uh, there has to be almost necessarily it has to be initiated somehow by an action of the main character. Uh, so there has to be an invocation of, of, of that. He has to do some kind of appeal. And I thought that was interesting because even though it has, the, it has the visual form of a praying scene, in fact, the first thing he says is kind of, in, I think, very interesting. He says, I need to give you a heads up. Right. You know, God is meant to be, or the goddess is meant to be omniscient. In this particular case, we're saying in the, in the, in the secular science fiction concept, it's an entity uh, with a great deal of power, but she doesn't know everything, and she doesn't know what's happening on Earth and how they think, and she doesn't really understand what these human beings are all about. And when Jake gives that information. It's almost the reverse. Normally, the information or the fire or the gift, whatever it is, comes the other, the other path from the, from the immortal to the mortal. Uh, you know, and this is actually the reverse. It's, it, was, it was Jake says, I've got to give you a heads up. When you really know what's going on here, you're going to be pissed. You know, <laughs> and, and you know, the funny thing is it actually works. You don't think it works, and she tells him it's not going to work because in her reference frame, nothing like that has ever worked, but she's never had that information before. Uh, you know, so I, I think it's kind of an interesting scene because there's two layers to it. You know, I think uh, sp spiritual or religious people would say he's praying and the prayer works, you know, and a science fiction uh, uh, fan would say, oh, he's talking to, a, to an intelligent alien and giving it a piece of information it needs to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And both interpretations are, are absolutely valid. Yeah. And, it, and quite apart from Deus Ex Machina, you think it's... Tarzan on, on cosmic steroids because, I mean, he basically calls in all the elephants and they, you know. <laughs> I like that. Rampaging chimpanzees, yeah. right. Your question, ma'am. Yes, yours. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I think what you've just said Political is the, the right gets to right argue left. with itself over that one. <laughs> Like haul off, guys. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I threw all that stuff in there, you know, to kind of, uh, um, you know, cr create some create some sense of context or or, or conversation about the movie. Uh, you know, for me, it's there's a, there's a through line in the ideas from the from you know the imperialism of ancient Rome through the colonial period. You know, the the Europeans kind of rampaging through North and and, and South America with a, with a strong sense of entitlement and devastating indigenous cultures and all that right up through through, you know, recent events. And uh, people can read into it what they will. What I've found is from reading all the kind of blogs and reviews and everything and articles about this is that uh, the movie's kind of a bit of a Rorschach test. I think all movies are to some extent. But to the extent that it provokes conversation, people's reactions to it are based on their individual kind of bubble of reality and how they see the world. And I think that's kind of cool. I'm not going to, uh, you know, I, I don't feel I should have to explain the film because I think... I think you, you just kind of challenge the audience to think about these things and let, let them all kind of argue amongst themselves. Because that's what I used to do. When I go see a movie in, in college with my, uh, you know, kind of intelligent movie fan friends, you know, we'd leave the film, go to a diner, and talk for two hours. And that's, that, that to me is the ultimate power of a film, I think, is to, is to, is to incite conversation, inspire people's uh, imaginations, and, and get, them, get them engaged on the ideas. So the second you explain it, that goes away. You know, or say this is what I this is what I specifically meant, and you can forget about all that other stuff. 
and I don't think I should do that, you know. But I think it's interesting in a room full of writers that, you know, here you have a film that didn't need to have that stuff in it, uh, and, and, and in a sense, to be commercial. And in fact, the studio strongly resisted some of the ideas, especially the environmental stuff and some of the political stuff, because they felt that 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 they felt, you know, for the kind of money they were spending, uh, that's <laughs> going to compromise our, you know, people aren't going to like it, you know. And, and historically, you know, trying to sell a, a, a movie, a mainstream piece of popular entertainment that has a has an environmental theme is like death, you know. And and uh, so you know right now I don't know if if you know we we might be at two and a half billion by now if we hadn't put that stuff in or we or <laughs> or we might be at half what we're at right now you know what I mean in terms and I'm only I'm not saying the money for the money's sake I'm using it as a metric of how many people have been engaged around the world and are going to see the film again and, and talk about it well, we never know the answer to that because we don't have two identical Earths that we can release two different versions of the movie movie in you know. Not but yet. my instinct is that part of the power of the film is the ideas in the film as much as, as just the, the visuals of the film. When people talk about a movie being prophetic, sometimes they think, well, it foretells things. But I think when we look at your work, it's, it's clear that the, the real meaning of prophetic is you're looking at the present moment and you're looking at it so deeply that stuff stays true. For example, corporations are always, a, you know, corporations are trouble in your movies. You know, they, they, they are. And and there were even some pundits that were kind of throwing darts at you for that. We go, oh, another anti here he goes again. And then... I'll take their money. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then the Supreme Court goes and hands the, you know, hands over the power, you know, basically last week. So so your stuff's getting truer. It's not that oh, you're... We, 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 need, we need an example from last week to know yeah, this is true. Yeah. How about the last 200 years? Yeah. Right. It started with the Dutch West Indies company, yeah. you know. True enough. Now, let's see. Oh, there's a young man there with a question. Blue shirt. Yes. How indeed. Yeah. Let me repeat that question. <laughs> Having written it as long ago as you did, how did you estimate the technology that you would need? Do, you, do your parents know you're here? <laughs> <laughs> I've been swearing a blue streak here. And it, how old are you? Oh, you're all right. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's actually a really good question. Uh, at the time that I, that I wrote this, um, I had already made a couple other films, Terminator 2 and The Abyss, that had uh, computer-generated effects in them that had really given people something new that they'd never seen before and was, was cert- much talked about and very exciting uh, visually and showed a kind of glimpse through a doorway of what, what could happen next. And then Steven Spielberg came along and advanced that technique farther with, with Jurassic Park. And we were on a real roll at that point, really stepping into new territory with all this CG stuff. Now, you know, cut to 15 years later, eh, CG everywhere, it's no, big, it's no big deal. But at the time, uh, I imagined Avatar as, first of all, a dream project, the kind of thing I'd always wanted to do. But I felt that there was this wave of change in the technology that, that was just uh, uh, about to, to you know, really become a major force in our business. And I wanted to do something that would sort of jump a little bit ahead of that wave because uh, I was going to do Titanic, and I was writing this to do after Titanic. So I figured a couple of years down the line, this stuff's going to be a lot more mature. It's changing very rapidly. Well, what happened was uh, it didn't change as rapidly as I thought it was going to, to do. And when I finished Titanic, it didn't look like we could do all the stuff in Avatar uh, right away. So then I just I just kind of put it on hold for a while and did some other things and then came back to it. And even when I came back to it, it still we still had to work on the facial performance stuff and create our own uh, technology for that. How important was it to create a resemblance between the actors and the, the facial technology? Because that seems a very specific thing that you do plot-wise, but maybe it was just important artistically too. Just yeah. to well, certainly it was. I, th- I think it was clearly critical from the get-go, and we understood this, that the avatars needed to resemble their actors because we would see them, we'd see the actor in, as their human character and then as their avatar character, and then we needed to see the through line. So that then created a certain degree of humanness mm-hmm. in the overall uh, design of the, of the Navi. But I had this sort of conceit going in that, well, my, my Navi actors that never appear on screen in human form, they don't have to look like their, their characters don't have to look like them. Uh, and we did a test, and, and we, uh, we cast an actress to play, to play Neytiri, just for purposes of the test, who didn't really look like the character, and it was a disaster. 
Uh, and we just, we, we had no way of really feeling the truth of the performance across. I mean, the performance did translate. It was quite compelling. And if you didn't see what the actress had done, it worked just fine. Other people loved it. We hated it. Because we just, we just felt it wasn't, it wasn't right. It didn't feel like a pure uh, translation of the actor's performance to the CG. So then we decided that we were going to base the, the Navi characters on, on the actors. And then we had to cast actors that would look the way we, you know, so, so Zoe's very, very beautiful and has a long, long neck and so on. And, and uh, you know, so we used, uh, for, first of all, her character is exactly her from you know, mm. in, the, in the lower face. In the upper face, she's, you know, her cheekbones are spread out, her eyes are much larger, and her nose is much blunter, and she has a very kind of severe uh, right. profile, uh, which is not, not Zoe at all. Uh, but uh, I, I still feel like we had the essence of Zoe in, in her character, and we spent a lot of time on that. We did a lot of sculpting, both in, in clay and then ultimately in, uh, in CG. Because we, we like to get the sculpt as close as possible in clay first, then get it into CG, then, start, then to see how it starts to, to behave when you put a kind of neuromuscular facial rig on the character. And then you start to see things like when you start changing the shape of the actor's face, uh, and adding mass here and there and changing the eye size, certain uh, uh, facial expressions don't translate perfectly. So then you have to come up with a language of translation to get, the in, to get that facial expression to work in their character. Because mm -hmm. you know, we're, not, we're not just duplicating Zoe. We're mm -hmm. creating a character. I have a couple, time for a couple more questions. Yours. Hmm. Well, thanks Thank for you. That. This is me thrilled. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, my my first wife always said I was I was the only person she ever met who kept his instincts on file. So <laughs> no, we're, yeah, no, we're we're ec we're ecstatic. I mean, it's just a, a bit of a we're in a bit of a daze to tell you the truth. <laughs> the lab, the the remote At the lab. The end yeah. of the film when she goes inside the lab. Neytiri, well, Neytiri yeah. physically alters a bit when she goes into the lab of his world. There's, uh, there seems to be uh, a, an alteration. She seems less polished, less confident, perhaps, uh, or just everything was a different. Yeah. So how intentional was that? And well, I you? think here's the interesting thing there is that we found that, you know, because we, we, we distressed her a lot through the battle. She crashes her bed. She hits the ground at 50 miles an hour, goes through all these fights. She's got blood on her face. Her hair is all messed up. Her... Uh, makeup, which clearly she's applied herself, is now streaked and cracked from from facial expressions and faded, and and so she she's pretty distressed. I think in the heat of battle and in the forest environment, you're less aware of it, and then when you have a chance to settle down and actually watch her face, you're more aware of it. In fact, the truth the truth is we actually cleaned her up a little bit for that last scene because she was more distressed during the fight. And we cheated and backed off a little bit on the amount of blood and dirt and, and distressing just because we didn't want that all to get in the way of the, of the emotion of the moment. So we, we still wanted her to be the, the warrior who, you know, who had, had been through, through a tough fight, uh, but we, back, we actually backed off a little. It's interesting that your perception of it in that more sterile environment was that she looked, she looked, uh, you know... She looked more real in a way. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, we I think we on the on the film really love those last couple of close-ups. Partly because they're so they're so emotional, partly because you see a character that's layered with the ferocity of her war paint and yet she's in such a vulnerable state and she's so kind of kind of beaten up and yet she's transported by uh, by emotion at that at that moment as he revives and so on. So we're very very happy with with the way that came out and i remember there was a big discussion uh uh you know there were certain certain people in the film that said no you can't do the war paint it's really going to get in the way of the of the emotion in that final scene and and i said i think you'll see it through the through the paint i like the paint i think it's part of it's it's almost like she wears on her face her own her own courage you know and the tear across the war paint, I thought, I thought was you know w worked really nicely. And again, that's a CG tear. That's like an animator figuring out the tear. Now it's a tear that Zoe actually shed. You know, we wouldn't take that liberty, but it still had it. That's not something that you can capture. You can't. You know, we're capturing we're capturing an image of of her face. They had to still go in and animate that that tear, but they did it to do what her tear did. 
gentleman in the green sweater with mustache. Yeah. Your, uh, don't you have a mustache? I'm sorry, the lighting is... Uh, <laughs> so forgive me, and I, I change genders. I do all that. Sorry about that. Oh, what does it mean? The word Navi is a Hebrew word. What is it? Prophet. There you go. <laughs> no, I, I absolutely wasn't. Uh, you know, I just, well, I just the creation yeah. of the language is very interesting because even if you know you don't know that say Navi means prophet, it has this sense of native or natal. I mean, you know, the the the, the use of language here is really cool because it, it it the language seems very expressive. And I'm wondering, how did you devise that? Uh, well, it was a, it was a two part development. I did like the first five percent, and then and then uh, Paul Fromer, who was the head of, ling- of the linguistics department at, at USC a few years ago, uh, uh, did the rest of it. And uh, you know, so I would propose, uh, you know, like, like I came up with not the and with the apostrophe that sort of separates it into two distinctly pronounced syllables and things like that, and a lot of character names and place names, and they were based on. Uh, you know, certain, uh, you know, like maybe Polynesian sounds, maybe some sounds in uh, Tagalog and some sounds in Ma- Maori and things like that, things that, you know, I, I had heard, just like the sound of. And uh, then he came along and, and, and riffed on that and brought in, uh, uh, brought in a, a, st- a grammatic structure, uh, a syntax, and, and uh, you know, the... The, you know, he asked me, "How do you want to do this? Do you want to do, you know, a uh, uh, verb noun, uh, verb noun uh, uh, adjective, or do you want to do adjective noun verb, or you know, uh, do you want it to be like German, I to the store go?" And mm-hmm. I said, "Yeah, yeah, do that." Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, so um, uh, you know, he he basically came up with a a structure. He came up with the the various verb forms. And uh, he made up an, an additional thousand words and so on. You know, it's not truly a language in the sense that you could get a, a Navi dictionary because we only have a thousand words. It was enough to do what was in the script and then enough for us to, to, to make stuff up on the set. And basically mm-hmm. probably about half of it was made up on the set and eventually just had to have Paul there. Right. And Paul, you've got to come to the set because we're going to say, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to want to improvise <laughs> and we have to, we have to have somebody make up, make up the words before we can improvise. Yeah, by, yeah. by Comic Con of next year. Yeah, it'll exactly. Or the, of this year. Yeah, Comic-Con. it'll be a language. Now, I have one last question, which is about Hiroshima, because I understand that you actually traveled to Japan to meet, shortly before he died, uh, Mr. Yamaguchi, who is the one person that they know actually survived both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I was wondering, could you just. He sounds like an ideal point of view. Yeah, well, I read John Hersey's book on Hiroshima in college and, and uh, have always been fascinated by the, the subject. And uh, at some point, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, I thought, you know, I really need to make a movie about this subject. And, and uh, I actually went to, to Hiroshima uh, in, in 91 on National Atomic Bomb Memorial Day there and, and, and uh, uh, was, was you know, pretty much the only non-Japanese out of 200,000 people gathered around, the, around uh, in, in, in Peace Park there. And that was a powerful experience. And, and so I've had this in the back of my mind. A friend of mine that I've worked with on various book projects and various expedition projects, Charlie Pellegrino, uh, has been fascinated by this subject for years. And he actually uh, did some primary research going and, and interviewing a number of people who were actually involved in, uh, actually uh, victims of both bombings, who literally were in Hiroshima, uh, you know, got bandaged up at an aid station, got on a train, went to Nagasaki and got blown up again. Um, and it's uh, surprising the number that were even alive a few years ago when he started his research. I think there were there were close to a hundred people in all who had gone through, who had experienced both bombs uh, and survived uh, long enough to tell the to ta- d- tell a tale. Of course, they had a high mortality rate over the the subsequent years due to cancer and so on. And I think that by the time Charlie started his book, there were six or seven. And I believe Yamaguchi was the last, mm. and uh, so I was uh, I was blessed to get to to meet him, uh, really only a couple of weeks before he died. And he was in, in in a hospital. He was very lucid, extremely lucid. Very like he was a human Buddha. He probably weighed, I don't know, eighty pounds, and just was incredibly thin. His his skin was almost transparent, and he had this very kind of almost saint like demeanor. And his whole thing that he kept him alive after his son had died. Of uh, of cancer, probably related to residual radiation from from continuing to live in Nagasaki, uh, he kind of lost all hope, and then kind of was re- reborn, if you will, in the spirit that 
he was there for a purpose because you don't go through that without having some kind of purpose. And he became the, and he was, he was a very humble guy. He was, you know, he was an engineer. He worked in a shipbuilding yard, uh, but not like a high-end engineer. He was like a guy that designed parts, you know, and uh, not, a, not a philosopher, not a, not a well-read guy, but in his later life, he became this kind of ambassador of, of the idea of forgiveness. Mm. And, and uh, you know, his principle was, if I can forgive, Anybody can forgive. Mm. And, um, you know, he passed this on, and Charlie wrote it into his book. I found it very moving. I wanted to meet him. I knew he was dying. I wanted to, to meet him, and I knew I was going to Japan anyway right. uh, for promotion, so I took a little side trip. And um, we talked for a long time, and at the end of it, uh, he said, my duty is done, mm. because he had passed his story on. Of course, he had passed it on many times to many different people, but he felt that, that Charlie and I would be now the you know, mm-hmm. kind of the, the vessels for, for his story. So now i got a big responsibility. Yeah. You know. Well, we can hardly wait. And congratulations in the meantime on Avatar. Thank you all. For oh, thank you. Yeah.